All right, guys, um, picking up today where we left off the other day, I just wanted to take a moment. Um, somebody emailed me yesterday because I said, you know, be sure to let me know if you guys need the uh, handouts. And sure enough, the most recent handouts weren't on there. Uh, but then when I got there, I realized that I used the, uh, I remember we were talking about the salt marsh and the ponies uh, yesterday. Uh, that's your opening uh, slide here. So that was kind of cool. I forgot that it was... Uh, even on there, make it a little brighter so you can see it. But, um, but yeah, so that water goes in, that water goes out. But, oh, I only brighten my screen, not that screen. Sorry. Um, but the, uh, it takes a special kind of critter to drink that water. So, yet again, evolution uh, doing its thing. Um, the handouts. All right, if you haven't been to this site yet, Hey, what the heck, why not? Okay. Um, the PowerPoints that are up on the screen while I'm talking to you guys are here. All right. And um, just a short note, uh, I haven't had anyone officially complain yet, but um, I know there's some people that just on uh, my online classes say, oh, he must not be posting any new lectures. There's always a load more button at the end. Once you get to a certain point, I don't know why it doesn't keep loading stuff. Um, so you got to hit load more, and then you'll see the stuff that comes after. I, I wish that it would post the most recent at the top. It doesn't do that for whatever reason. So whenever you go to, if you miss a lecture or whatever, you got to scroll all the way down. And, and they're dated, all right? Um, like Luke and I were talking a couple minutes ago. You know, it's, it's, it is fairly simple to figure it out, but... If that uh, show more button, if you don't see that, you might think that I've just stopped posting stuff. And I do try, at least um, I sit down after after this class on uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays and I try to update all my classes. You just watched me doing that here because, well, after I'm done with you guys today, I got to bail. But um, uh, otherwise, otherwise, that's what I do after class. So it's it's almost always going to be here. I upload it to YouTube first, then we grab the code off of YouTube, embed it right into here, and uh, you have the option of watching it <coughs> right here in the screen, or if you want to, you click down here. For some strange reason, you don't want to watch it on D2L, and it'll open it up in uh, the YouTube for you. So, anywho, like I said, just wanted to take a minute to show you that. All right, so what we were talking about um, are different aquatic ecosystems all right and um, these are a bit more complex terminology wide at the very least uh, than than the uh, terrestrial ecosystems uh, I'm not sure why they chose to go into to greater detail here but um, they, they did all right so we have a lot of uh, conflicting vocabulary because of that. And, you know, when we were talking about, um, say, the different uh, trees, uh, whether you were in a, uh, uh, <laughs> none of the words are coming to my mind now, um, whether you were in a forest uh, up towards the North Pole or you were in a forest down by the equator, we're still talking about animals on branches and eating leaves. And th those words didn't change. But now we're throwing so many different, you know, profundal zone this and uh, bathy that and the other thing. Yeah, bless you. Um, so, again, I, it, it, on your guys' end, you kind of got to keep this straight, whether we're talking about fresh water or salt water. <coughs> and I will try to keep the questions as simple, as simple as possible. So we left off talking about this. Uh, we started in fresh. We ended up at estuaries, which is a blending. And then now we're in full-on marine. Okay. Um, same idea as lakes, but guess what? They're deeper. Okay, well, that makes sense. It is the ocean, I suppose. Should be a bit deeper than our lakes. Um, but it's more than just that. Okay. There's waves, tides. And currents. Well, the marine environment is the ocean, right? Yeah, marine is salt. Um, you'll see marine, you'll see salt, you'll see saline, um, you'll see oceanic, 
we've got about five words that we use to talk about when we're talking about Oceana, so. yeah yeah so you know that's close enough to ocean that you guys w would know that one but a lot of the other words mean more or less the same idea um so we did mention that that some lakes can have waves if they're big enough uh lake ontario around here is certainly big enough for waves um sylvan beach uh what is that lake oneida lake uh i was there over the summer or early fall uh, i had to spend a whole lot of time there uh, in my 20 years but um they had some waves not huge but there was lapping and it was probably related to some boats zooming by way out there but it is big enough to catch wind and uh, create lake uh, waves but but the tides not really measurable okay uh currents again probably there's something going on we talked about um a little bit of uh upwelling or some some really deep lakes but all of that is a whole nother game when you're out there on an oceanic level okay if you spend any time at the beach you know tides oftentimes it can be a matter of you know 10 to 20 to 30 feet um you get there early you think you're getting a great seat uh, and then the next thing you know, your chair is practically underwater, or at least your towel is wet, and, and so on and so forth. Um, tides are a big thing. Um, the currents. Well, hopefully you didn't have to mess around too much with currents, but if you or someone you love uh, ever got um, messed up with something called a riptide, which is a current, a rip current, um, you, you know. Okay, I actually got caught in a rip current once, and... Um, a lifeguard did have to save my life. It was it was freaky stuff, and it was the last time I was ever on a board without a leash. And I've made sure my kids always have leashes on their boards. And if you guys go out and bodyboard or you surf, probably don't surf. You're not close enough to the water to surf. But you try to be a weekend warrior with bodyboarding. Sometimes always have a leash because if you lose that, you're on your own. Okay. So, anywho, just a little. PSA there. Um, riptides are, are horrible things. So sometimes you see those. Uh, longshore drift is another current. Longshore drift takes sand and moves it um, for um, condos and uh, towns that are trying to maintain their beaches. It's a big pain in the butt. You know those walls of rocks they put out into the water? That's their attempt to um, save their sand it breaks up the longshore drift or the longshore current uh it actually ends up making things a good bit worse um but if everyone puts one up and it's kind of it kind of work it, it kind of seems like it works better for them um it just it makes different problems but that's why they have those rock walls usually it's to try and save their their sand um so tides and currents it's a, it's a much bigger thing and we did talk a little bit about uh, these these currents, um, not the tides so much, but the currents in the uh, previous uh, chapter. And I don't plan on going back to those. Okay, so this has been about niches, and it's, we're back to talking about niches. So now, instead of, what do we have? Profundal, limnetic, and littoral. All right. We have... Intertidal, pelagic, and benthic. I, I, I can't do anything about the change in terminology. Um, this is way too overly complicated. So here is shore on the far left side. Here is shore on the far right side. Okay. And in between is an entire ocean, apparently. So let's say that this is uh, uh, Cape Cod, and this here is going to be um, Britain. I don't know. All right. And we got all this in between. So wh why they attempted to conquer all this, I don't, I don't, in one slide, I don't know. Um, intertidal is just what it sounds like. Okay, you're, you're in the splash zone. You're in the tidal zone. Um, <clears throat> the water comes in, the water comes out, there's rocks, there's sand, there's critters, there's people. If you go to the beach, that's where you are, okay? The neuritic, think near. Near shore, neuritic. 
Uh, if you happen to go out on a boat, do a charter, take a tour, go whale watching, anything like that, you're out in the neuritic zone. You're near to the shore. Pelagic. All right. That's that's deep water. That's deep water. And then it comes back again as we get near to the other shore. We're out in the um, the near the near zone, for lack of a better word. And then you're back in the tidal zone again. In between. Well, you've heard of these things. We don't really need to talk about them right now because they're not where critters tend to live. Uh, but we've got the continental shelf, the continental slope, continental rise, and the abyssal plains. We're going to talk about this much more with oceanography. We are going to do, uh, oh, oh, nope, I'm sorry, I'm thinking of my earth science class. Uh, we probably won't touch on this a little more. Uh, we do a week at least on oceanography in that class. Um, yeah. Okay, we'll talk after class. I'm, I did email it to you, but I'm, I'm in the middle of lecture right now. So uh, if you're like me, I always uh, really couldn't figure out why they call this the continental rise. Um, they're talking about it from the perspective of the ocean. You're coming off the ocean floor, and you are rising up to the continent uh, and the slope. Slope makes sense. Slope is, you know, goes up, goes down, doesn't matter. It's still slope. Um, but yeah, I always wonder why they call that the continental rise, and it's perspective-wise. You're coming this way, because we're always up here. So I'm thinking, you know, da -da -da -da, you're walking out here. But continental shelf, you are more or less on when you're in the, uh, the intertidal zone and the neuritic zone. You're standing out there, you know. Continental shelf goes out a way a lot farther than you could stand. But, all right. So, like I said, don't worry too much about all this stuff. If, if we had the time, uh, ocean floor is kind of cool stuff to study. Um, the trenches, you're familiar with those. Abyssal plains, you've heard of the abyssal plains, hopefully. Um, the Hadal zone, Hades. It's named, it's, it's, it's the deepest bits. Hades. Yeah, yeah, the Hadal zone is named after Hades. Um, like yeah, well, or hell, yeah. But, uh, oh, but the, I did it. yeah. Um, but yes, the, the god Hades, too. Um, so, uh, that's your oceanic trenches. We talked a little bit about them with the uh, uh, the deep sea vents, the chemosynthesis. We mentioned that briefly. That's not in every ocean, but there are a few few places unique that you get those. All right. So again, uh, intertidal, pelagic, benthic. Um, we didn't really talk about the benthic. Benthos still means the same thing. All right. Benthos still means the same thing. So bottom. Uh, but we've luckily we've got a slide for each of these here. So intertidal. Uh, as we said, this is along the shoreline. And this is a life, uh, I don't know why I said live within, life within, however you want to word it. Yeah. Uh, within the high and low tide marks. Um, this is a very high energy environment. I, I might have mentioned this the other day when we were talking about um, where a critter, you know, decides to make a go of it. If you live in a stream, you've got that constant flow of water. Um, you might want to find a nice rock to hide behind so you don't have to constantly keep yourself upstream. Uh, same thing is true uh, in this environment, okay? The waves are relentless, 24-7, 365, and then some. Um, not only that, they are constantly, you know, battering you around, not just pulling you back out to sea and then and washing you back into sea, but you're tumbling around, you're banging around, ideal, uh, not ideally, but you can be. And as you know, it's full of rocks and sand and, and all that other stuff, okay? Um, so, it's a tough place to live. However, it is a very, very rich, please stop, very, very rich uh, environment, species, and and numbers of species, okay, for as tough of a place as it is to live. Uh, the pelagic zone, all right, the pelagic zone is, and I know this is slightly different than the way I just described it to you, but 
all of the ocean water from the shoreline to the deepest depths, um, subdivided in zones based upon deep sunlight. All right. Um, I shouldn't have used the word pelagic earlier. I, I, I see the next slide. Uh, you guys can't see it yet. I got a different view on here. I should have used the word oceanic for that deep open ocean word. But yes, technically speaking, pelagic is shoreline to shoreline. Um, so the neuritic zone, that word we used a moment ago, that is the uh, shallow waters close to shore. Remember the word near is in there, neuritic technically, but if you mispronounce it a little bit, it'll help. And then oceanic is the word for once you get off the shelf and out into the open ocean. Okay. So these are horizontal. We're going to be talking about vertical separations in a minute. Euphotic. You means true. Photo is light usually when you see that photo. That's light. So this is the part of the pelagic zone where the sunlight shines through. And because of that, you've got your food chain going. You've got your, um, your plankton floating around. Plankton. Now, 488 feet is a very exacting number, and I hope you know enough about science now to know that that's going to vary, right, um, on, on, on so many things, whether you're near shore and there's a whole lot of sediment in there. It could only be maybe five feet, but the next day it'll be nice and clear, and then it's 20 feet, and, and so on and so forth. So when you see numbers like this, you know, if I were to turn this into a test question, um, I, I might say, um, how far, you know, is the, how deep can the sunlight shine down? Or in the euphotic zone, how far can it go? I'm going to say, you know, approximately 500 feet or, um, you know, approximately 450. I'm never going to ask you for 448. And I'm sure as hell not going to put 449 and 447, 489 and 487 on there. These, this is not math class. These are not exact numbers. Always just seems silly when they do that. But So that's not my number. That's a textbook's number. But just think about all the variables that could be out there. Okay? So I guess on a perfectly clear day in perfectly clear water, that sun drop may not go one inch further than 488 feet. Somebody must have measured that one day. But anywho. So that's where the light can get through. That's a lot of water. It's a lot of water. Um, 500 feet is, um, you know, well, it's 500. Oh, we got these weird tiles now. Used to be the tiles were standard 12-inch squares. And I could just say, oh, it's 500 tiles. Go out there and count them next time you're bored walking through the hallway. But now we got these weird rectangles, and who knows how long they are. But... Um, Sounds like a lot, all right, it's a tenth of a mile, but um, vertically, that's the difference. When we turn these things that you're used to walking on every day basis, uh, horizontally, it's, it doesn't end up being a whole lot. Um, but vertically, ew, it's pretty deep. All right, neuritic zone. Now, again, the, neur the, the euphotic zone is in the neuritic zone. Where, euphotic just measures where light can get through. So in the neuritic zone, quite frequently, the <coughs> euphotic zone goes all the way down to the bottom, especially, again, as we said, if you're really near to shore. So overlies the continental shelf. Um, this is where the majority of your floaters and swimmers uh, live, okay? Your critters. Yes, there is some deep ocean stuff out there, but we're talking about the majority.
And again, I'm not keen on asking you numeric questions, so don't uh, plan on wasting your brain trying to remember 650 feet. All right, the oceanic zone. Remember, we're going horizontally again here, even though we started talking about vertically a minute ago. Part of the pelagic environment where the uh, you're over the ocean floor itself, over 650 feet deep. This is obviously the majority of the ocean. There's a lot of shoreline, don't get me wrong, but there's way more just open ocean out there. Um, I know you can you know, only just picture this in terms of a map or a globe, but you know, think about the distance between uh, North America and, and Europe. Think about the distance between um, Asia and North America, okay, or any of the southern hemisphere continents for that matter, but um, yeah, it is a good bit larger. Absolutely. Okay. So yeah, there's plenty of coastline, but there's way more open water out there. Um, so mm, don't want to do that. Now, going back to our talking about how, how 500 feet deep, okay, um, now you, with greater than two miles, remember there's 5,280 feet to a mile, right? So we're looking at 10,000 feet now. We've jumped magnitudes, magnitudes. So 5,000 or 500 feet is, is, is now nothing, but uh, when you're dealing with the terms of, you know, 10,000 feet. Um, obviously, your sun isn't going to penetrate any deeper out here. So this is cold water, high pressure. It's high pressure, by the way, because of the weight of the water. Uh, it should be, I don't want to say common sense because then you feel bad if you didn't think of it that way. But it's, it's, it's just like air pressure. It's just the weight of the water. Um, and again, why we have to worry about that with submarines and stuff like that. Those, those need to be pressurized. Uh, just like airplanes do, except the opposite, right? Airplanes, they're going up to low pressure. But in a submarine, you're going down into high, high, high pressure. So they need to push out with just as much pressure as the ocean is pushing in on them, or you'll crumple into a little can of tuna. Um, yeah, yeah. So in the air, as you go up, you get less dense. And so you have less air pressure. And as you go underwater, you get more and more water above you, so all that weight pushes down on you. That increases the pressure. So, right, they have to have equal pressure pushing out. The ocean, the pressure of the ocean will smush it down. Like you, huh? Yeah, I don't know that one. Oh, 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 yeah, they did have a, yeah, I, I know, know, I know what you mean now. I didn't recognize the name. Um, yeah, they had some issues. They apparently had a lot of issues. I remember hearing about they that. Had a <laughs> they had a lot of issues. Um, and no sunlight. So it's dark. Okay. Um, so again, when you are talking about a food chain, if you have any sort of food chain, it's not going to be that solar dependent one. All right. Uh, and that's when we get into the realm of, of chemosynthesis and all that stuff. Marine snow. Um, if you do live out here, you're essentially a scavenger. Okay. Um, you've got all this stuff that is just dead waste floating down. Um, it's, I don't want to say it's like a desert, but it, you know, it's the equivalent of living in a desert. You get what you get. It's not really enjoyable to live there, so on and so forth. Um, but some organisms do make a go of it. Again, benthic. Benthos still means bottom. B bottom, just like we had neuritic near. There's some little tricks you could use to help you remember all this crazy vocabulary. Benthic bottom, okay? Um, and here's the crazy bit again. 
the ocean floor spans all kinds of different environments, all the way from you being in the tidal zone, inner tidal zone, sorry, uh, to you being at the bottom of a trench. It's all ocean floor. So to say that it's a benthic creature, there's a heck of a lot of difference between something that's going to run around in the splash zone and something that's going to live, um, not even if it is a deep sea vent, but somewhere in between those two. All right. Just totally different lifestyles. So it is not a um, very specific term other than saying the critter lives on the ocean floor. Uh, sands and muds. Okay. Uh, and yeah, guess what? It's divided into zones as well. Uh, as I just said, all right, we've got the neuritic uh, kind of ocean floor, and we've got the oceanic zone uh, kind of ocean floor. I'm not going to subdivide. I don't think we're not going to subdivide the breakdown. Um, not going to break down the uh, neuritic zones. All right, but we are going to break down the oceanic. Bathyal, abyssal, and hadal. And if I did ask you these, I wouldn't ask you the numbers. I would just say which of these is arranged in order of increasing deepness or something like that. <clears throat> abyssal uh if someone has ever said something you did or uh great on a test or something was abysmal you knew that wasn't good right um and it's a root derived from this word abyssal um before we knew about the the deep sea vents um you know we thought this was it this was the bottom and that's kind of what what abysmal came from and, and so on and so forth uh, we then later, as we got our little yellow submarines and started exploring um, the oceans more, we realized that there was somewhere deeper. And I guess why that's where they went straight, you know, for the word hell there. Um, but they didn't want to call it hell, so, you know, we'll disguise it as, as uh, Hadel. Why, by hell, you mean like you don't know what's in the ocean? No, 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 just d deeper. You know, hell's supposed to be deep down in the earth kind of thing. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that, that's all. It's just... Well, the imagery, yeah. yeah, yeah. But so that they're just going for that. Uh, actually, they uh, World War Two was the very beginnings because we had um, a lot of oceanic warfare. A lot of um, yeah. you know subs were very big then. I guess there were some subs in World War One. I. I don't know war history that well. But I do know that in World War II, we, we started seriously mapping things. Yeah. But that was mostly military. For private... Um, yeah, yeah. For private um, lives and scientific research and stuff like that, it, it was 50s, 60s. Um, Alvin is a really famous little submarine and um, that uh, Woods, comes out of Woods Hole, which is uh, not too far away from here, actually. Uh, oceanographic, oceanographic Institute, um, and that's when we really started uh, getting it for scientific. I'm sure a lot of the early stuff was, you know, seriously classified, um, but fairly recent. Within, well, I guess now that we're in uh, 2024 here, um, almost 100 years, I'd say. Wow. Isn't it the question for that? Are jellyfish considered swimmers or floaters? I would say they're swimmers. Um, floater, I would say. I would say they're a plankton. I don't know. Plankton. You could only do, you. they can. <sighs> I mean, Spongebob, they go jellyfish. Like yeah, let's, let's, let's not use Spongebob as a reference as much as we have to. Um, I know, I know, and I allude to it myself. Uh, they can swim, but they sure as heck can also get pushed around by the waves. Um, call them what you will. 
with a little asterisk next to it, knowing that if if we do want to call them Planktonic, then um, we do know that they have certainly a, a decent amount of control. If we want to call them um, uh, Necton, um, which are the swimmers, uh, we know that they're they're light enough that they're not going to really be able to work against a current and so on and so forth. So they're definitely that's a good question because they're, they're definitely right right down that that line there. So uh, it, it's come up a couple times conversationally already. Um, what is the deepest part of the ocean, in case you're wondering? It is the Marianas Trench, uh, which comes in at 6.83 miles, okay, um, or 36,070 feet, uh, plus or minus, and here's another one of those, I love that, 131 feet. Now, here's the thing, this is a trench, so picture maybe going down into a mine, okay, um, you're, you're walking on the floor, and you've got a, a wall over your head as well. So where do we stop measuring? You know, as far as our submarine can go, uh, as far as we get nervous and start to be a little hesitant, could you go 100 yards down the trench that way and go a little deeper? They, they, they shouldn't be throwing such exacting numbers around. Um, but, you know, 36,000 feet. I think that's a number we could all agree on and say, damn, that's deep, okay? Um, and uh, let the engineers worry about if it's 70 or 71 feet. Um, so, anywho, point is, is, is we're way deeper than the average. Now, this is a trench, and what that means um, to you guys, you haven't really had a whole lot of plate tectonics. Um, you probably had some in earth science. We certainly didn't talk about it in here too much. What a trench is, is it's a plate, um, a plate margin, okay, a plate boundary. And it's a plate boundary in which one of the plates is being um, pushed under and another one is winning. So you have this gap, this seam, where you've got, uh, essentially, you know, you could walk down into a cave, for, for lack of a better word, or that mine reference I used a couple minutes ago. Um, there is life there, all right? I think I've showed you some video when we talked earlier on about the, the black smokers and chemosynthesis. Don't really think they expected to find anything there. Um, but once we did find it, 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 it kind of made sense really quickly. Everything except, you know, how did the critters get there? How did they, you know, make a go of it at first? The bacteria had to be there first. But otherwise there wouldn't have been anything for the other critters to eat. But um, it's pretty amazing, pretty amazing find. Um, okay, so we are, for some reason, going to go back to the shoreline now. And we're going to talk about some stuff that, for thank goodness, you guys know what the heck I'm talking about. So we're in the benthic zone, which means we're on the ocean floor, but we're near shore, near Riddick. So neuritic ocean floor. And we're going to talk about three types of environments that are there. Seagrass beds, kelp forests, and coral reefs. All right. And hopefully a couple of those you're like, oh, actually you can picture that. You know what that is. I was talking to you the other day about seagrass beds uh, about in Maryland, all right, where the uh, crabs love to uh, hide and grow and, and uh, grow up, all right? And then all the cow poop was coming down the river and um, really letting the grass go crazy. It's hard to mow seagrass, in case you didn't think about that. Uh, so flowering plants adapted to uh, complete submersion. So these guys don't even have to. Remember emergent and submergent plants? We talked about that. All right, these do not ever uh, come out of the water. Um, 10 meters, all right, it's photic zone. Again, that's where life, uh, light, light uh, is uh, shining down. They're below the wave action. Waves have cycles, um, and, and there's lots of gears working to make a wave work. Um, it is true that a wave won't break until uh, the bottom of it hits the 
um, the, the, the floor, the part you're standing on, all right? And, and that's where you could watch and see, uh, you could kind of predict where a wave is going to break because, you know, where there's high parts, sandbars, and, and whatnot out there. Um, it's actually a good bit of, of science to surfing. Um, but uh, so the waves won't break until the, uh, the wave cycle, the, the part that's churning around the gears, hits something below. So um, these guys can just kind of do their, their flowy, grassy underwater thing, go back and forth all day long and not really worried about getting chewed up by the waves. Uh, it looks hopefully exactly as you'd expect seagrass to look like. It just looks like grass. Okay. Um, and uh, they are an amazing um, source of food, shelter, protection. And all green plants, of course, do photosynthesis. So it's, it's important for keeping the, uh, at least that part of the water uh, oxygenated. The kelp forests. Uh, kelp forests are, I've only seen the tops of them, and I've got a picture or two that show you otherwise. But imagine a stand of, of you know, pine trees or any kind of tree you can picture that's just totally all underwater. And instead of uh, squirrels and birds running around, flying around, doing their thing, you've got um, fish and sharks and jellyfish swimming around in there. And then on top of it, like you might have, I don't know who lives on the top, top, tops of trees. Like monkeys just came to mind, but I'm not sure monkeys live that high up. Um, but instead of whatever happens to live in the top of the trees in the forest, um, you've got otters and stuff like that. Otters love to live in kelp forests, but at the very top, they kind of hang out like in hammocks, you know, on these, on these branches of the kelp. Um, this is what we call seaweed, quite typically, when it breaks off, okay? Um, they're up to 200 foot high, as it says here. It's really brown algae. Uh, we see them in the cooler waters of North and South America. Uh, so think uh, Northwest Coast here. We've got them down California way as well. But West Coast of North America, I think East Coast is too warm. Maybe far northern. If you get up into Maine, we might have some. But, uh, but um, yeah, you don't see them. You don't see them too far, uh, too much on the East Coast. There's always this assumption, and I know I had it. I, I finally got to see the Pacific Ocean two summers ago. And I'm thinking, oh, California, it's, all, it's warm, sunny, you know. Every, no. We were in San Francisco, Santa Cruz, and a few other places just a little bit further. California is very long, all right? It goes through a lot of uh, temperature zones. Um but you could go a good bit down the West Coast and still be quite cold water. So uh, we do tend to see these guys over there. Uh, it, even though it says brown algae, it is photosynthetic. All right. And uh, like I said, I, I wish I had a bigger picture to show you. That's fairly big on the screen, I guess. Um, but just, just an underwater forest is the coolest thing. And it doesn't hurt that there's a picture of a shark swimming through it. That always makes it look even cooler, right? Um, it's not something they eat, though. Not something that a whole, I'm sure somebody eats it, but more than likely they're eating the uh, stuff that grows on the leaves, okay? Um, but the kelp itself is apparently not typically eaten. Huge diversity. Really rich ecosystem. Everybody knows coral reefs. Yeah. Um, coral reefs, coral tends only to grow in your warmer waters. It's very temperature sensitive. Um, coral is uh, made out of calcite, the mineral. All right, I see calcium carbonate on here, but you might be better know it as calcite. Um, calcium carbonate is like Tums and Rolades, uh, but uh, calcite. And um, if you've ever seen a little piece of coral, that's not the animal. That is the uh, apartment building or the condo that they live in. Um, if you have a piece of coral at home or you're at the pet store buying cat food or something later this week, go over to the fish aisle and find a piece of coral, the, the branching kind, okay? 
And on that, you will see a whole bunch of little circles or asterisks on the corals, on the coral branches. Those are the little pockets where the coral lights, the little critters, uh, actually lived. Um, they look like, do you remember in like seventh grade science where they probably had to drop a water and they had you look at something called a hydra? All right, a little guy on a stock with all the little fronds out. There. Coral lights look a lot like that. Um, but they are communal and they get together and they build, they secrete calcite. Instead of having one seashell, they build a, uh, an entire, like I said, a condo or an apartment building, whatever you want to call it. And um, they live as a group uh, there. Um, they are uh, filter feeders. They're not carnivorous. All right. Um, so they stick out their little tentacles. They grab what they can. And then they zip back down in there. Uh, kind of like a snail goes into his shell. They could go back into their, their uh, thing. Um, so the coral itself is, is, like I said, not the critter, but it's, it's uh, home for many of them. The, uh, <clears throat> the coral reef, I'm going to switch slides. There's still a bullet to talk about there, but I want you to see it while we're talking. This guy's, this is coral on top of coral on top of coral on top of coral. And yeah, there's anemones in there and, and, and all that stuff. But what that last slide was saying is that only the outermost shell is alive. Okay. They grow right on top of one another. Um, and uh, it just, you know, it just is. There's also probably some sponges in there too. Um, coral looks like all kinds of different things. It's not just that branchy stuff that you see uh, all over the place. Um, there's a lot of different corals in here. Um, and like I said, but there's also, anytime they show you a picture of a reef or you're at an aquarium, um, you're, you're going to see that stuff that looks like broccoli or cauliflower with some little tentacly things on it. Those are probably anemones. Might look like mushrooms to you. I don't know what they look like, but <clears throat> to you. Um, but you've got sea anemones, um, the sponges again. Um, and on top of all of that is algae. And there's a weird little symbiosis going on here. Uh, these coral reefs are very dependent on, on algae. They, they, they give the algae a home, something solid to, to live on to. Um, but they get stuff from the algae as well. So if you pay attention in the news to this kind of stuff, you might hear about the, uh, the corals are bleaching. Okay. It's nothing to do with laundry waste or anything like that. What it means is the temperatures are changing and the algae are dying and they're losing all those amazing colors that they have. And that's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. Um, so, and, and when you go, if you're lucky enough, I've never been myself, but if you're lucky enough to go somewhere where they let you snorkel over the coral reefs and, and all that stuff, you aren't supposed to touch them. They're, for being as, you know, a hard, hard, hard uh, calcite, um, they really are very fragile uh, ecosystems. Um, and, you know, what? You could certainly cut yourself on coral, sure. I don't know, just touching it, it's not like it's a super sharp knife or anything. But, uh, yeah, you could certainly cut yourself on coral. Um, but more so, you don't want to disturb the algae. You don't want to, you know, the anemones will sting you. That's for sure. Um, but uh, you just you just don't want to mess around with that stuff. And, of course, you guys, again, grew up probably with Nemo and all that stuff. Um, you've got all kinds of fish that live in and around these areas. Um, just Just huge. Huge biodiversity. This is sort of your rainforest of the ocean, if you would. Okay, it's just that, that rich. Um, but like I said, they're super, super sensitive things. And um, they've been around forever. Uh, Florida itself is, is coral reef after coral reef after coral reef sutured together. Um, it's, it's all limestone, and it is... Uh, old coral reefs. So we've been doing coral for a very, very, very long time. And uh, hopefully we will continue to have coral. It's a, it's a neat stuff. We got kinds of reefs. An atoll, you might have heard of an atoll. A barrier reef. Fringing reef, yeah, you probably haven't heard of a fringing reef. But um, so this talks about with regards to how it, um, it interacts with the land, I guess is the best way to think about it. Uh, we'll start at the bottom, actually, and look at a barrier reef. Um, 
This is a reef that grew off of an old sandbar or some old rocky ridge that's out there. And it's, it's grown uh, big enough that when a tide is out, all right, it actually leaves a separating uh, ridge and you get a lagoon. In other words, you've probably heard of that. No, it was a specific thing. All right. Uh, you get a lagoon there uh, between the land and the reef. Uh, you can only get past that when the tide is high. Uh, and even then, it's going to be probably pretty sketchy. Um, if you were a boater in the area or whatever, you would go to where there's a known, you know, low spot, so to speak. Um, so that's a barrier reef. It literally provides a, a barrier. Think about it like on a highway, one of those cement dividers. Uh, an atoll is pretty cool because it is uh, circular. Same idea, but it, it forms a, a bit of a ring. You get the lagoon in the middle. Fringe reef. Eh. What does it say? Directly attached to a continent, no lagoon. Um, you know, the f yeah. So that would basically just be, uh, you could almost just sort of walk out on it. The sand would at some point turn into this reef material. But uh, you guys worry about the other two. I grew up watching Gilligan's Island, so uh, lagoon was always a word that was in our vocabulary as little kids because they, they were always on the lagoon. Gilligan's Island, it's a silly old TV show back in the Brady Bunch kind of era, um, 70s kind of TV. Uh, but they were stranded on a desert island, deserted island, um, and they had a lagoon. All right. That, thank goodness, is the end of, um, of that. And uh, as I said, it's... It, I'm sorry? Um, so we're done with that part of the chapter. And um, there's a lot of, and, and I, I think in a good way, because there's a lot of um, terms in there that are very close, very similar. And come next week, when we are uh, con more concerned about focusing on the test, we will, uh, just ask me, remind me to, to look through the test, and we'll give you some areas to focus on, okay? Because there's there's a whole lot of terms there, and um, I don't want to say that that a lot of them are are, are are meaningless or useless, but there are certainly some that are more relevant or important than than others. Um, and as this is just one uh, facet of the test, you know, we'll certainly try to narrow some stuff down for you as we can. So uh, I, I do believe that is the end of my. Um, PowerPoints for Chapter 6, the Aquatic Ecosystems. Um, at the moment, I forget what chapter we're going to next, because we haven't been going in order, if you hadn't noticed. I've been following uh, Professor Williams's uh, traditional uh, procedures, so I don't know where we're headed next, but uh, hopefully it'll be something that we can uh, kind of topically tie in to the content that'll be on this this test, uh, which again, we're still aiming for uh, Thursday of next week. All right, so start preparing yourself uh, as if it were on Thursday uh, to go back to, um, I wish this toolbar wasn't right here in the middle of everything, to go back to our uh, class page for a moment, what that entails then Is, 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 so I didn't put water cycle on the last test, if I remember correctly. I think we skipped that, right? I'll look through my notes. So water cycle, um, that atmosphere in the wind, which again, I will certainly narrow down for you. That was a bit of a train wreck. Uh, terrestrial biomes, a lot of easily asked questions about that stuff. Think about all the different ecosystems we talked about. It's just straight vocabulary words. Um, there is some application in there. What are the effectors? Okay. 
Remember, we had moisture, we had latitude, we had temperature, um, that little triangle we talked about. So there's a lot. I would say the at least half of the test will probably come from this terrestrial biomes uh, chapter here. And then we've got um, the aquatic ecosystems from Tuesday, today's aquatic ecosystems, and whatever we end up doing next Tuesday. Okay. Um, I am pretty sure that 4.1 was on the last test. Uh, I think I only skipped 4.2. So that's a decent amount of content. Water cycle is very easy testing again as well. Um, you've got the phase changes uh, in there. You've got um, you've got a lot of stuff that lends itself really easy to uh, to asking some questions in there. So. Uh, you can start focusing on that. I would review if you have some study time over the weekend uh, or you want to get started. I would certainly work on the terrestrial biomes and the water cycle stuff. So, questions about that? Okay.